we're going to talk about a story, okay? Do you have any siblings? Do you have one brother? Well, I have one brother. Are you the older sibling or the younger sibling? I'm the older sibling too. Okay, so you so you feel me where I'm coming from on this. Okay, so there's this story about a mom at the beach, okay? And so the mom has two children. You have the number one child, raise your hand, we're number one. And then you have the other one, okay? <laughs> and so let's say the two children are at the beach and they're playing, we're building the sand castle, we're close to, close to mom. The other one, is playing in the water. So what happens if the one, our sibling, our brother, who's in the water is having some issues, like trying to swim, what, is the, what does mom do? So that doesn't mean that mom loves the other child more than you, but that your brother was in need. And he's younger, so he might need a little bit more help. And so that's how we are in this world. God is a spiritual being, and he needs us to be the hands and feet to help out people who are in need. Amen. Let's pray. So I'm going to have you repeat after me, okay? Creator God, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We ask you to protect anybody who's hurting, anybody who needs your help. We know that you are the solution to this broken and lost world. God, we love you. God, we thank you. God, we praise you. And God, we lift your name on high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Good morning again, church. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Happy Sunday, church. Happy Sunday. A lot has happened really since the last time we worshiped together. Um, number one, I started a new career. Amen. Amen. And it embodies Matthew 25. And so we'll get into that a little bit later. University of Michigan won the national championship. Go Blue. A little bit more excitement. We still were going up. And the Lions are in the playoffs. A little bit more. <laughs> On the other hand, our tax dollars today are invested heavily in war, in really several wars, contributing to the death toll of over 20,000 Palestinians, most of which are women and men, women and children. In addition to the countless lives, our brothers and sisters are in Israel. To some, we are fighting against terrorism, yet the reality is we're invested in a genocide. In a recent report from our very own Presbyterian of Detroit moderator, Kevin Smith, he equates the militant organization of Hamas to the city of Gaza, thus justifying the loss of thousands of lives. In his statement as the moderator, he is speaking for not just this church, for 70 churches in southeastern Michigan. Currently, our per capita dollars are being controlled by the Senate of the Covenant of the Presbyterian Church USA by an administrative commission and an executive team who are still perpetuating pay inequity and white supremacy. Last year, I questioned in this pulpit, why do black women make less than white women? The Senate of the Covenant decided to ensure that every election and hire from 2022 to 2024 has been all white people. Eight out of eight elections for leadership and commissioners for our church 
and five out of five new hires for our presbytery have all been white women. The Senate of the Covenant took the pledge to address this racism, and instead of moving us farther away from it, instead they, the decisions expedited its implementation. American writer James Baldwin once said, I can't believe what you say because I see what you do. Church, it's hard being an American Presbyterian today. It is hard. We pray and we have good intent with our investments, amen? amen. We trust that the people that we elect will make the right and ethical decision, but just remember a misinformed or ill-informed people will always be subject to manipulation. James, the brother of Jesus, shared words for us as bystanders and the people that we have elected for the Senate of the Covenant and the new Presbytery of Detroit staff who are faced with this ecclesiastical challenge today. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says they have faith but does not have works? Can faith save them? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Church, if your faith is dead, the question this morning is, are we really living? Church, we are living amongst the walking dead today. See, God has given us this body to learn the necessary trade and skills to build his kingdom. He has given us the Holy Spirit to guide our mind and our thoughts. He has given us Jesus, a life, a death, and a resurrection to be our soul. Yet time after time, those who claim to be members of this body seem to be malfunctioning because somewhere, somehow, there is a disconnect. Somebody say disconnect. You know, I stumbled upon a few words that I would like to share with you this morning. The greatest man in history had no servants, yet they called him master. The greatest man in history had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, yet he lives today. His name was Jesus, amen? Mm -hmm. I always thought it was interesting that, you know, God could have instructed Jesus to go become a Pharisee. He could have said, you know, go through that process. Go become an inquirer, then a candidate. Um, go through that committee and that committee get voted on by the elder Pharisees and whatnot and then approved by the sect which is comparable to a presbytery. But God didn't do that. We know that the Bible talks about the Pharisees and how they oppose Jesus but it says little a bit about the process to become one. And so I did some research about the Pharisaic movement and in order to become a Pharisee you had to have number one knowledge of the law. See, Pharisees were expected to have an extensive amount of knowledge of the Torah, which is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and the oral traditions associated with it. Number two, they needed strict observance of the law. Pharisees were known for their rigorous observance of the law, including both written and oral traditions. This would have been a prerequisite for any member to join um, the sect. Then training and education. While the Bible does not detail the educational process, it is likely that Pharisees underwent a significant religious training. Um, this can include studying under a rabbi or a teacher and learning the interpretations and the applications of the law. Membership and acceptance. This is when becoming a Pharisee probably involved that um, being accepted by existing members of the group this can include demonstrating knowledge, being questioned, and their commitment of the interpretations of the law. Now, doesn't this sound like becoming a teaching elder in the Presbyterian church? You know, back in the day, it used to be called the minister of word and sacrament, where you would have to have a master's of divinity. And when I think about a master's of divinity, I think about somebody who would have mastered the divine. But church, none of us 
can master the divine. Yet today, only those who have mastered the divine and approved by a small group of people can achieve the title of teacher or teaching elder. But Michael, we know that the Pharisees are the religious leaders in biblical times. So it would make sense that our religious leaders mirror them. Yes, the process. But perhaps maybe I am misinformed on the spiritual identity of this denomination. Are we Christians or has becoming Presbyterian replaced Christ with Pharisee? A, pa a pastor once met with a session and drew three circles. So you have the middle circle, the, the initial circle, the middle circle, and then the largest circle on the outside. The pastor asked the session to define, you know, the church and what it reaches and who is in control. And so on the outside, they put the community. On the inside, the second on the inside, they put the church in the session. And on the center circle, they put the pastor. And so the pastor laughed and said, but where is Jesus? Jesus is not at the center. And as great of a reminder that is, they are only, you know, to, to the defense of the congregation and the session, they are only able to provide what the pastor is feeding them on Sunday morning. Just like in school, you cannot always place blame on the teachers. Sometimes the parent has some type of accountability. Have we become a church for the people that despised Christ? Because if our behaviors don't align with what Christ would have modeled in the modern day, then again, church, we are among the walking dead, much like the Pharisees where the marquee outside of the church just becomes a tombstone with our name on it. The good news is the death comes before the resurrection. And in order to receive the resurrection, we must acknowledge the death. See, church, the women visited the tomb and the body was gone. Today, we are holding on to what we think the body is or what the body should look like. So we will not receive the resurrection if we cannot let go and see that God is indeed doing a new thing. And this new thing is inclusive and welcoming of all of our brothers and sisters. Now, church, there was a point where I was just frustrated with the decisions some people were making in the church. And sometimes the human side of me still gets frustrated. Um, but then I understood why some of these people are like this. They are what Matthew describes as whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, but on the inside they are full of bones of the dead and all other kinds of filth. So you also on the outside look righteous, but to others on the inside are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And I want to repeat that one more time because this right here is scripture. This is coming straight from the gospel according to Matthew, where he describes the Pharisees, those religious leaders, as whitewashed tombs, which on the outside look beautiful, those garments, those fancy robes. But on the inside, they are full of the bones of the dead. So you also on the outside look righteous to others, but on the inside full of this hypocrisy and lawlessness. See, Matthew, I believe, used this imagery very intentionally because he also saw the walking dead amongst religious leaders. Now, there is a genuine passion in his voice in this scripture, but also a deep, overwhelming sense of sadness. He is witnessing people who cite the same scriptural text as Jesus, but practicing a different lifestyle. Church, there is much repair that is needed before the conversation of reconciliation when it comes to racism. That is something that I've always said. But today, where I am today, church, I believe there's a deep need for rehabilitation for those religious leaders who think they are doing things in the name of the Lord, but in reality perpetuate the same inequities impacting marginalized people in this world. 
I'm going to read that one more time. Today, I believe there is a deep need for rehabilitation for those religious leaders who think they are doing things in the name of the Lord, but in reality perpetuate the same inequities impacting marginalized people across the globe. In this new chapter of my career, I drive rehabilitation strategy in partnership with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. In my role, I provide career consultation on what I like to call career therapy to my residents who are finishing out their incarcerated terms at my facility. I've heard some amazing stories. Some men and women have spent maybe 25 years in prison. Some are here on a violation. Some are my age and have spent the last seven to 10 years behind bars. And that's hard. That's, that's a very, that's, it's, it's very, it's very hard. And when our residents reach 30 days in our facility, we have a round table discussion with each resident is allowed to share a bit of their story, what got them here, but also what they have been doing in the past 30 days in this road to rehabilitation. And so to my black male residents, I pose this. Have you heard that one in four black men will be incarcerated at some point in their lifetime? And one person responded, I don't believe in statistics. You know, I think that we are here because we made our own decision and now we are held accountable. And I believe that is a great response. But I share with them two things. I said, number one, that statistic is from 1995 but look around. And I'm gonna tell you what I see when I look around. Second, beyond these walls of our facility, there is a rich diversity of people. But as I walk around the three floors of this facility with 250 residents, I would say that between eight to nine times out of 10, it's a black man walking around. Anywhere from 19 years old to 75. And that's hard for me. It's very hard for me to see myself, to see my brother, to see my father, to see my uncle, uh, when I see my residents. Identities are stripped when people become institutionalized or imprisoned. Reduced to a number and a new affiliation, you were convicted of a crime. Therefore, now you become a victim to the time. And as an empath, I do not just see numbers. I see names. I see stories. I see families. Church, that's somebody's son in there. Church, that's somebody's brother, somebody's father, grandfather, husband, significant other. Now, in 1995, the Department of Justice for the United States of America released this report regarding the lifetime likelihood of going to state or federal prison. And I don't know what they used to, to find these numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's either, either close to accurate today or even worse than the numbers seem themselves. The empirical evidence from 95 suggested that given the average white American male, there would be a 1 in 23 chance that he would be sent to federal or state prison. 1 in 23. That's 4 out of 92. In contrast, over 1 in 4 black men would meet the same fate. And I believe this was based on a fear that we created that dates back to when black people were possessions. Therefore, any deviation outside of total submission is seen as deviant behavior. The sermon I preached last January of broken people, the Presbytery responded to that and challenged what I said. Again, I said, I believe that this one in four black men would face this fate is based on fear, and because black people used to just be possessions. Therefore, any deviation outside of total submission is seen as deviant behavior. There is a fear associated with blackness today. And we aren't the best at making decisions while in fear, but that is the expected 
But that is expected even biblically when we see some bad decisions made under fear. Church, we know from history that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. served time, as well as Malcolm X, as well as Nelson Mandela, as well as Paul. And that's how we got Romans. And I'm pleased to say at the age of 27, and I'll be 28 in just a couple weeks, I have not served time. And I give all glory to God and all thanks to a praying grandmother and a praying mother because there have been times where people have made false reports in an, in a, in an attempt to incarcerate me. When I think about my mom being a single mom raising two sons, the statistics of her having two sons go up to becoming a 44% chance that myself or Jordan will serve time in a state or federal prison. That's insane to me. That's insane. And so in contrast, when you look at the average American white family, um, you, would, you would have to have 14 children to have that same 44% statistic. I don't understand. I don't understand. And so as we celebrate the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. today, do you know the strongest yet vulnerable community who stood with and beside him, black women. His wife, Coretta Scott King, was an advocate and leader and peace champion in diversity, equity, and inclusion before it was a trend, a short-lived trend, um, and all before she met Brother Martin Luther King Jr. His mother, King's mother, was a choir director for a church, Alberta Williams King, and she was assassinated six years later after King was assassinated, but she died while she played the organ during morning worship. Why must black women continue to suffer at the cost of the fight for change versus the fight to keep things the same? Church, we are in a civil war in our church today. And while most people are standing by and wondering what to do, I am just thankful for the support from your congregation on what can we do? You know, whether it's a listening ear, a hug, or just saying, we love you and we stand with you. That's way more than a lot of people out here right now. And this is what it really means to be a Matthew 25 congregation praying and going beyond that prayer because we understand that faith without works is dead. Church, that is the first step. What it means to open our hearts and receive the resurrection. That is the first step to repair and rehabilitation needed for our church to right the wrongs in both history and current. On this MLK weekend, I would like to close this message with three stories that should remind us to always put our trust in God and not in the world. From the bustling streets of New York's Bronx to the hollowed halls of Harvard, this woman's journey is one of groundbreaking achievements and unwavering dedication. Born to Haitian immigrants, her story is a tapestry of perseverance and intellect. Her early years in Saudi Arabia under the tutelage of her engineer father and nurse mother set the stage for a life of inquiry and service. At Stanford, she honed her analytical acumen. Later at Harvard, her dissertation in government echoed with the promise of political insight. As Dean of Arts and Sciences and later as Harvard's first black president, her tenure was marked by a commitment to equity, inclusion, and academic excellence. Whether navigating the complexities of campus culture or championing initiatives for social change, her leadership reflects a profound understanding of the power of education to bridge divides and ignite minds. Now for my next story, it starts in the heart of Detroit's east side. A woman of resilience emerged. Her name is now synonymous with leadership and spiritual guidance. She embarked on a journey that defied the, 
the conventional. Her academic pursuits at Eastern Michigan University were but the first step. A praying mother who supported her endeavors stood as the foundation of her ambition and success. Now she ventured into the world of Disney, absorbing the magic and wonder, and then pivoted her focus towards aiding those in the shadows, leading a rehabilitation program for female victims of domestic violence. Her corporate tenure at Fortune 500 companies was marked by driving results and fostering unity across diverse departments. Entrepreneurship beckoned and she answered, creating her own business. Yet a deeper calling resonated within her soul. This call steering her path towards the church. She studied at Detroit's very own Ecumenical Theological Seminary with a concentration in urban ministry. As a Christian educator, a pastor, youth mission coordinator, and served and led over 15 ministry teams and committees on the Presbytery, Senate, and General Assembly level, today she stands as the only black mid-council leader in the entire Senate of the Covenant, a beacon of hope and transportation. Now for this last story, be with me, be with me on this one. Now in the quiet hours of the night, thoughts often wander to those who have left indelible marks on our lives and society, such is the case with this woman as well, whose story is both inspiring and heart-wrenchingly poignant. She served as the Vice President of the Student Affairs at Lincoln University of Missouri and just tragically passed away by suicide. Having endured what was described by her family as bullying and severe mistreatment, her tenure at the university, though brief, just lasting 255 days, was a testament to her dedication to education and student welfare over the course of her career for over 25 years. At North Carolina A&T in 2016, she defended her dissertation titled, My Sister, Myself, The Identification of Sociocultural Factors That Affect the Advancement of African American Women in Senior Level Positions. This work poignantly highlighted the multifaceted challenges faced by African American women in higher education. Challenges of unfair treatment, feeling like an outsider, and being undervalued due to intersections of race, age, and gender. Her research was not just academic. Her research was a mere reflection of her own lived experiences, deeply understood and felt even in her final days. Now her passing is a stark reminder of the pressures and realities that black women face today. It calls for a collective introspection and, a and action both among black women to prioritize self-care, recognizing that they are not superhuman, and among the wider society for us to engage in this honest conversation about the unrealistic expectations and stereotypes placed on black women. It's a call to work towards dismantling these harmful narratives. Church, her legacy, her life, her work is a beacon of knowledge and an enduring call for change. May her contributions and her story never fade from memory, serving as a continuous inspiration and a catalyst for meaningful progress in challenging the in, in challenging what's faced by African-American women in academia and beyond. Church, these three stories include black women who have gone through mistreatment, disrespect, and the ignored pleas and cries, tears for support. All of them led to the first woman's forced resignation from Harvard University the second woman's search for healing from an organization that was supposed to embody the body of Christ, the love, embody the love of the body of Christ, and the final woman's tragic death. These three women represent three names, three lives, three stories. Dr. Claudine Gay, Associate Executive Sharon Barconi, 
and Dr. Bonnie Bailey. Excellence, church, excellence is not enough anymore. The walking dead isn't confined to the church. The disconnect from mind, body, and soul exists everywhere. Anywhere racism lives, the walking dead will thrive. I learned when leaders in the Senate of the Covenant of our Presbyterian Church USA discovered a way to put an expiration date on God's grace for certain members of staff, there is an evident disconnect from the mind, body, and soul, my Lord. Now, Dr. Gay shares with us a deep reflection of her experience in a New York Times piece just posted, I'll say maybe last week, titled, What Just Happened at Harvard is Bigger Than Me. And it's, it's such a profound piece. And it speaks to a consistent theme amongst these three stories and the challenges we face as a society and as a church. She says, having now seen how quickly the truth can become a casualty amid controversy, I'd urge a broader caution. At tense moments, every one of us must be more skeptical than ever of the loudest and most extreme voices in our culture, however well organized or well connected they may be. The campaign against me was about more than one university and one leader. This was merely a single skirmish in a broader war to unravel public faith and pillars of American society. It is not lost on me that I make an ideal canvas for projecting every anxiety of the, about the generational and demographic challenges unfolding on American campuses, a black woman selected to lead a story institution. Racism is literally killing our black women, their lives, their careers, their health and well-being. And I'm not going to stand here and just watch what's happening. I'm not going to stand here and let my mom continue to suffer. Yet these three women are phenomenal women. They embody strength, resilience, and the gifts were shared with organizations that sometimes may not have deserved them. And still they rose. And then still we rise today. These women, for me, epitomize American excellence. They epitomize woman excellence, and they epitomize black excellence. Denzel Washington shared that his mother told him that man gives the award and God gives the reward. And I pray that each of these women know that God will reward and has rewarded them, whether in legacy or a chance to share their story. Even though each of these stories resulted in a different outcome and some same outcomes, they all face the same challenges. They all face the same sickness. These toxic behaviors and personalities that led to pay inequity, a forced resignation, and a suicide, all of them exist within the Presbyterian Church USA. All of them exist in the Senate of the Covenant. All of them exist within our leadership and different people within our Presbyterian of Detroit. An attack on a black woman is happening right now, and I'm not gonna just sit by recording it happen. I'm gonna stand in the way and say, you're not gonna put your hands on her. That's what I'm gonna do. And I'm glad that your church is standing with me in that fight. Church, I hear this morning on this MLK weekend, King charge us to challenge and to not conform. Church, I hear on this MLK morning, church, for him to charge us to address and adapt and not address and ignore. I ask God to forgive us when we ignore the cries of people. I ask God to show mercy on us when we ignore the signs. I ask God to turn us from our wicked and unchristlike ways when we ignore the people. At this point, when we become unable to confess the unwritten sins outside of our book of confessions, we aren't living anymore. We join and we become the walking dead, a body disconnected from the mind and soul. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. Amen. Amen. 
I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Amen. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Amen. I was sick and you looked after me. Amen. I was in prison. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Amen. We are not the walking dead church. We are a part of God's new creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, church. Thanks be to God.